Hi. Hello, Kagglers. Welcome to the Kaggle Reading Group. We are continuing with the paper that we started last week, which is on NMT. NMT here is Neural Machine Translation. Sounds like somebody's having a drag race out there. I'm sure they aren't. Um, on Neural Machine Translation Search Errors and Model Errors, Cat Got Your Tongue, by Felix Stahlberg and Bill Bjorn. Burn, Byron, maybe one of those things. Uh, and we started this last week. And do I remember how far we got? Not really. We definitely finished. We looked at this graph. So I think we're probably uh, around here results with length constraints. Um, and we are definitely going to finish this uh, this time and maybe even have a little bit of time left over, uh, in which case we'll probably poke around and see if we can find their code and uh, play around with it a little bit. Good morning, good morning. Well, I don't know that it's morning for you, uh, Lilith and Alessandro and Sazad. Welcome. So uh, something that did happen in the week, which is super cool, is that one of the authors, uh, Bill Burn, maybe? Sorry if I'm saying it wrong. If I ever say somebody's name wrong, it is not uh, anything wrong with their name. It is my own uh, ignorance and uh, linguistic background interfering with the correct pronunciation. Uh, reached out to me uh, in a really nice email to help uh, clarify the difference between modeling errors and search errors. Uh, so if you were tuned in last week, you might remember that um, the big finding of this paper uh, so far is that uh, beam search, especially with a very wide beam, was, uh, sorry, beam search, even with a wide beam, was making search errors. So the best candidate was not being chosen all the time. But when you had a more comprehensive search and you knew you returned the best candidate, um, there were more modeling errors and there was a bias towards returning the empty translation. Um, so just as a little um, review of neural machine translation, or maybe an introduction to neural machine translation if it's not something you're super familiar with. Um, the general way that machine translation works is you have um, an input um, string uh, or source string. Usually I think they're called source and target in machine translation. I should say this is not my sort of main area of focus in NLP, but I've read in it, uh, you know, a fair amount. I'm sort of familiar with the field. Um, and we've read quite a bit of Transformers work that's focused on neural machine translation as well. So um, particularly the Vaswani paper, uh, Attention is All You Need, that proposed the transformer architecture of um, family of architectures, I guess, for, for deep learning. Um, that paper was on machine translation, neural machine translation. So the way it works is you have uh, your source, sentence, string, whatever it is that you are, whatever unit you are translating over, um, and then you do some math <laughs> and you generate a bunch of candidate translations. Um, and the uh, generation of candidate translations is this search errors here, so finding potentially good translations uh, is where you would get the search errors. Uh, and then from among those um, candidates, you pick the best translation using your metric of choice. Uh, and that's what you return as the translation. So that's sort of the general idea. Uh, hello, Nutton and Abdul, welcome. The uh, thing that we were struggling with a little bit last week was, um, so search errors, it was pretty clear to me what was happening. It was whether or not you were getting the, um, you know, the best possible translation returned in your search results, basically. Um, but modeling errors were, uh, I was struggling with a little bit. So Bill very kindly wrote an email, uh, and I have his permission to share this. This is only part of the email, um, discussing the difference between search errors and modeling errors in uh, a little bit more depth. So we'll start by reading this email, which you probably won't be able to find. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> I've done a good job uh, of, of information security. Uh, so suppose there's a quality measure Q of Y such that Q of Y is greater, such that uh, Q of Y greater than Q of Y prime implies Y is a better translation than Y prime. Um, so this is some quality measure you would you would want to have, right? This is sort of a how good how good is the translation. 
Uh, Q is a general measure of quality not related to any particular NMT model. Q of y greater than Q of y prime should mean that humans prefer y over y prime. Um, so this is, uh, it looks like a binary uh, distinction that you would make, uh, and that ideally you want this, this measure Q to match up with human uh, judgments of quality. Um, and judging quality of machine translations, especially in an automated way, is uh, very difficult. Um, a lot of people use blue, and I have a, uh, a whole big old blog post I wrote about this, uh, about specifically what blue is and its um, benefits and shortcomings. Uh, and I think it's called, uh, here we go, uh, evaluating te text output in NLP, blue at your own risk. Um, blue is B-L-E-U, which stands for something. It's an acronym. I definitely used to know that off the top of my head. So let's just assume that the quality measure exists. If we are building a model P, then the model should assign model scores, i.e. likelihood, that are consistent with Q. In other words, if Q, of, uh, if Q of Y is greater than Q of Y prime, then P of Y should be greater than P of Y prime. So um, in this paper, I believe we were using negative log probability or just log probability. Definitely one of those two. Uh, so you want the model to agree with this sort of quality measure that you assume exists. Uh, model errors are when this doesn't hold. If P of Y is greater, uh, less than P of Y prime for Y greater than, so Q of Y greater than Q of Y prime, then we have a model error. So if the model says, hey, so candidate two is the better one, but this quality measure that aligns with human judgment says, no, 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 candidate one is the better one and they disagree, that's a modeling error. In this case, the model is an error because it prefers the lower quality translation for this quality measure Q. It is usually necessary to assume a particular quality function to actually count model errors. But an empty hypothesis is so obviously the wrong answer that we can assume that Q um, slash S, so that just means um, end, of, um, end of sentence, end of input, end of string, uh, is less than or equal to Q of Y for every Y for whatever possible quality measure might be used. Uh, sorry, in other words, for whatever possible quality measure might be used, the empty translation is always amongst the worst possible translation. So if I say translate this and you're like, okay, done, that was a translation, it was nothing. Did you like that? Probably you're gonna be like, no, <laughs> I gave you input, you gave me no output. Did, did not enjoy that experience, zero out of 10. Um, so the point is that this quality measure is hard. Well, it's not the point, but the background is that this quality measure is hard to know or figure out. And if you could do this um, quickly, mathematically, you would have pretty much solved machine translation. Uh, but in pretty much all cases, some translation is better than no translation. So that's a way that they can sort of, um, because this is a little bit of an edge case, that's a way that they can be sure that they have some information about what this quality measure would return. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, Vishal says, this is all obvious. Why is there a whole research paper for it? Um, so this is, sorry, this is background about the difference between modeling errors and search errors. Um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The thing that the paper gives to the field, the contribution. Whew. The contribution of this paper is to show that um, beam size does not, increasing beam size, so considering more candidates, does not actually lead to higher quality translation. And when you know that you have the highest possible quality translation in your candidate set, um, current models are not necessarily returning that translation. So this is, this is just background uh, to help us um, uh, situate our uh, reading. All right. Uh, therefore, we count a model error anytime the system picks an empty translation at its highest scoring hypothesis. Um, so you can't necessarily know uh, what the quality for a given translation is. Um, and especially given that 
there's a sort of one-to-many problem. Uh, even for human translators, the same input may have many different equally good outputs. Um, it's I mean, machine translation is a hard problem. Translation period is a hard problem, even when humans are doing it. Um, and then adding sort of an automated component to it makes it um, you know, hard, hard to automate something that is already hard to do. Uh, less rigorously, these results suggest that NMT, neural machine translation, systems might be deficient, i.e. that they assign significant probability to uh, derivations that do not yield translations. In this way, they might not define a probability distribution over translations in the same straightforward way that, e.g., an n-gram language model might do. Um, so we've been talking about neural methods, um, n-gram methods, and I don't know, people call them statistical methods sometimes, um, were more common. I mean, people still use them, but um, they were sort of the thing folks were doing before a lot of the neural methods became more, more viable. So, oh, I've got a, got a Python mug today. Um, so, a classical language model, and we've talked about, I don't know if y'all, any of y'all are tuned in for the, the, the BERT papers or the GPT-2 papers, or any of the sort of the language modeling papers. Uh, people may argue with me about whether or not they're actually language models. Um, so a classical language model assigns a distribution over, um, you know, chunks of the language, n grams in this case, so a gram being, you know, a word unit, sometimes it's a word, and especially in languages like English, sometimes it might be a morpheme, uh, and then n would be the number of language units that you would put together, uh, they could also be characters. Um, and in an n-gram model, you can compare probabilities because you can generate a probability for every sequence of words, and uh, I believe what they're suggesting here is that that is not necessarily the case for neural machine translation models. So the way that we are selecting candidates in neural machine translation is generating errors in a sort of an unexpected way. So, uh, yeah. All right, uh, and there's a uh, additional paper, um, ACL. ACL is the Association for Computational Linguistics. It's um, the professional organization for NLP, basically, especially NLP researchers. Uh, and it's also a number of conferences, and this is particularly the conference ACL. Um, I think th this paper was published at EMNLP, which is also an ACL conference, uh, by Yining Chen, Sorcha Gilroy, Andreas Maletti. Jonathan May and Kevin Knight. So uh, an additional um, citation there for you if you're interested. So that's some background. Um, when we were talking about uh, search errors, do you get the best possible result back? Uh, when we're talking about modeling errors, is your model actually returning the best result from within its set of candidates? So separate problems. All right, uh, so trying to remember where we where we were uh, last time. It's been it's been just like a normal week, but it feels very long. <laughs> it feels very long. Uh, so we talked about beam search as a way to generate candidates, and this is one that is very common for people to use. Um, so the idea with beam search is just to go through the algorithm real quick because we got, we got a little bit of time. We don't have that much of the paper left. Um, beam search is a depth width first search. Um, it is mostly used for uh, data sets where you have too many candidates to compare at one time. Um, so with machine translation, there's lots and there's lots of possible um, outputs. Um, so uh, an example from the paper, uh, with a vocabulary size of 32,000, which is not, not a large vocabulary, uh, there are already more possible translations with 20 words or less than atoms in the observable universe. You can't um, tractably <laughs> look at all of the possible candidates and compare them all to each other. Uh, okay, so beam search is helpful in this type of situation where you have a really large, rich search space. Um, and the way it works is that you start with an empty translation uh, and then 
you uh, empty out this um, next variable that you're using to store your potential candidate translations to save for the next round of beam search. Uh, for all, I believe Y is the current translation and P is the probability of that translation using, um, what did they use? Uh, log P of Y given X. So the log probability of the current translation given the source translation, which is the sum over J. What is J? Where did J come from? I believe J is the length of the sequence. I'm pretty sure J is the length of the sequence. Um, the log probability of uh, the Jth word in the translation given the uh, previous words in the translation and the source sentence, uh, and then you sum that over all the words in the translation. And the problem with this is because you are adding log probabilities, uh, your uh, uh, Adding more words will always make your probability go down, so longer translations are always less probable than shorter trans. So, so a translation y is always going to be more probable than a translation y prime, that is y plus one additional word, regardless of how good that word is. Um, so that's one of the one of the potential problems. Um, sorry, one of the reasons that is leading to the modeling errors where the empty translation is preferred because it can be more likely than a translation of a longer length. Uh, sorry, so that's the that's the P here. Uh, in current, so uh, we have initialized that with uh, an empty translation, and we've added things to it through this this loop that we're in now. Uh, and we add uh, things to our next hypothesis. So this is. This thing that we've we've zeroed out here, um, if they the next token in the sequence is uh, the end of string sentence or end of sequence token. Um, uh, otherwise, if the uh, so we add the hypothesis with the ending. If the next token is not the end token, then we add all possible continuations given our vocabulary. Uh, and then we select from uh, our current set, uh, which is uh, all of the words, all of the, the candidate translations we generated in the last round, and all of those candidate generally all of those candidates with the next uh, token being the end of sequence, and all of those candidate translation with the next token being all of the possible continuations. From there, we select the n best, um, and n here is the beam size. So if you have a beam size of 100, every round you select the top 100 candidates. If n is 2, every round you select the top 2 candidates, expand on them, select the top 2, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, continuing over however long it is that you are um, continuing. Actually, no, it actually says here, uh, until y tilde is s hat. Okay, so until you can't add anything but end of sequence tokens to your, um, all of your inputs. So uh, you sort of like, you're making little trees and you're picking out the best trees and you're adding to those trees and then you're picking out the best trees from those. Um, well, you're not selecting the tree, you're selecting the path down the tree that is the most probable uh, and the nth beam sizeth uh, number of those trees. So that's beam search. Uh, and this does not guarantee returning the best candidate translation. So they proposed uh, depth first search, a, a version of depth first search that is guaranteed to return the best translation. Um, and instead of um, instead of sort of going through and expanding a bunch of possible candidates and then picking the best ones, uh, the best top and best ones, that's the beam size, uh, they uh, start by going down a tree and they continue going down a tree until they, um, they continue sort of expanding and going down the tree until the candidate translations no longer meet um, some threshold that's set. Uh, and if they find a candidate translation that has a better probability than any other candidate, then they resell it the uh, translation to that. So basically you look for something like, oh, this is the current best one. I'm gonna throw away everything that's not as good as the current best one. Continue, oh, there's something better. I'm gonna throw everything away that's not as good as that one. Um, so uh, in the best case, this might be pretty short because you, I mean, 
In the best case, you find the best candidate translation right away. Uh, in the worst case, it's the last one you find. Um, so very variable amount of time, uh, not very time efficient, but you are guaranteed to find the best candidate translation in your set. So no search errors, guaranteed not to have them. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Ryan says until it outputs an end of sentence token. Oh, for for when it uh, when it stops going through through beam search. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a. I think I mentioned this most weeks. There's a little bit of a lag between the stream and where I am in time, so I'm not ignoring you. It's just taking a while to catch up. Um, for example, right now I have my glasses on, but in the stream I do not because <laughs> I took them off. Uh, all right. So those are uh, the two search algorithms that they're using. It is most common for people to use Beam Search because it is more time efficient than this potentially looking at every possible candidate translation. And they recommend not using that in, um, in projects. This is just to sort of um, uh, to pick apart the difference between modeling and search errors because if you know you don't have search errors, then problems that arise must be due to modeling errors. If that makes sense. So, uh, I'm going to, let's start with section three, which I think we've read, but I think uh, we have we have plenty of time. Uh, and it's worth going over these results again. Um, actually, let's just look at the figures from section three and then hop back in with section four, which I think is actually where we were. Uh, so, section three, um, here we have, excuse me, uh, table one, which is neural machine translation with exact inference. Um, so again, knowing that you have the uh, uh, best um, search candidate. So uh, in greedy search, which does not necessarily return the best search candidate, uh, blue is pretty high, and I believe you want blue to be high. Um, there are a large number of search errors. So in 73% of cases, it is not returning the best candidate. Uh, but there's also seem to be very few modeling errors. So um, it never returned an empty string as the best translation. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so y'all can see a little bit better. Uh, in beam 10, so this is beam search where every round you keep the top n candidates. Uh, blue is pretty good. Uh, this is the length ratio, I believe. So the length of the input sequence to the output sequence or the source to the target sequence. Especially in languages as closely related as English and German, you want that to be more or less one. Uh, uh, Ryan says, in Andrew Ng's course, he points out some troubleshooting heuristics in order to figure out which failure is coming from your beam search and which is coming from poor model output. Oh, good to know. Uh, so beam 10, slightly better than greedy search, the number of errors. But again, over half the time, it's not returning the best candidate. Uh, but it's also not returning empty strings as the top translation. And then exact search, where you know you're getting the best candidate. No search errors, fantastic, that's what we're looking for. But a large number of modeling errors where the top uh, translation is the empty translation. Um, and this is specifically with a neural machine translation model. I believe they're using a transformer-based model. Um, with an n-gram-based model, based model, you probably wouldn't have this problem, uh, I believe is the... Uh, uh, point that was made in the email. A little bit more about this. So looking at the effective size, um, there seems to be a increase in blue, which again, you want to be high, as the beam size increases. So there's sort of a little peak at about 10. And then as beam size continues to increase, blue starts to go down. So looking at more candidates is good until it suddenly isn't anymore. And when we look at length ratio, which is again the ratio of the input to the output, output to the input, you want it to be one. Um, the more candidates you consider during beam search, the lower that goes and it has an elbow probably around, well, what would you say that is, eight-ish in there. Uh, 
So larger beam sizes, you yield fewer search errors. So this is going down. There's so many axes on this graph. Okay, so the red lines ignore this bit. Yeah, so they're just the blue score, the beam size on this axis, and then search errors on this axis, I guess? Anyway, <laughs> uh, the uh, larger the beam size, the fewer search errors, but the more modeling errors, and you can tell because uh, the length ratio goes down. Uh, and then if you look at uh, even very large beams, you don't get zero search errors. You can see this goes down to about 54%. So over half the time, you are not returning the best candidate translation during search. Uh, but uh, you're like, okay, well, maybe we're just not looking at a big enough beam. So increasing it all the way to 100, you still have search errors. Um, looks like a little bit over 50%. So in about half of cases, you are not returning the best uh, uh, the best candidate in your search errors. Uh, and the log likelihood of the returned um, the top candidate uh, is steadily increasing, but also it, it's empty more often. So it's more likely given the log likelihood, but it is not necessarily better from a human user standpoint. Scooch, scooch, scooch. Let's go down here. Uh, so here is uh, another sort of way of showing the um, uh, ratios of the length of the uh, target and source to use the NMT terms. So this green one, I'll just sort of trace it with my mouse because I don't know if y'all can, uh, if anyone's colorblind and can't see this. So this is the exact uh, example where we know for a fact that we have the best candidate. And the mm, certainly the plurality of cases have a length ratio between 0 and 0 0.1, which means that it is returning basically just an empty translation. Uh, the reference, so these are the human translations, have a... Uh, ish distribution um, with a mean right about one and a standard deviation of like, I don't know, 0.2 ish in there. Uh, and then beam 10 uh, has a distribution, a length distribution that follows the um, human reference distribution pretty well. Uh, it's a little bit more, you know, squished. So it looks like the standard deviation is closer to 0 0.1 than 0.2 ish in there. Uh, and the, the mean is right around one. Uh, so having a narrower beam, even though you're going to have more model errors, makes it less likely that you're going to return an empty candidate. And then uh, I think we've talked about figure four down here. Uh, so this is the number of search errors under beam 10 and empty global bests over the source sentence length. So the red here, which is this top line with pluses, is the number of source errors. Um, so source length is the length of the input sentence in tokens. It's German and English, so probably words, I'm assuming. Um, and as the source sentence gets longer, the percentage of uh, returned search errors also goes up. So the number of times where you do not have the best candidate returned um, in your search increases under beam 10, so using beam search with a beam of size 10. Uh, the number of times where you get the empty uh, translation returned as the best translation also increases. Uh, and then the number of search errors, once you remove um, instances where the empty translation returns, also increases not quite as fast, but it does seem to be um, going up. Uh, and then table two is uh, just comparing different types of uh, machine translation approaches. So uh, LSTM is the long short term memory uh, model, which is a flavor of RNN and for, mm, 
Well, I was in grad school like three years ago. Bidirectional LSTM with attention was sort of the reigning type of model. Um, it's still performing very well for a lot of tasks, but uh, transformers have sort of come over as like the new hotness, um, which I don't know. I got feelings about uh, the field chasing specific model architectures, but that's a talk for another day. Uh, and then SliceNet, which is a convolutional model, which looks like came out the same year as um, the transformer architecture. Uh, and then transformer base and transformer big. And it looks like blue goes up when you move from LSTMs to convolutional to transformer based models. Um, search errors do go down if you're excluding um, the base. Uh, and the number of empty translations also does appear to go down. So transformer big has the highest blue. Uh, still, again, a third of the time you are not returning the best um, the best candidate translation, uh, but it is returning the uh, empty translation a little bit less often. Uh, but still, not ideal. Uh, about a quarter of the time you ask for a translation, it's just like. <laughs> you get nothing, uh, which is, you know, as a user, that would be frustrating. So uh, historically, one way that people have gotten around this, and I believe there's some citations further up in the paper, is that they have uh, length constraints. So um, you can add like a little reward, penal uh, reward penalty, reward function. It's not a function, it's just like an amount to every additional token to avoid that thing where um, longer uh, sequences get penalized in lower probability. Uh, or you can um, say, hey, uh, if you are returning in uh, a very short sequence, I'm going to penalize you. So some, some ways that people have gotten around that. Uh, to find out more about the length of deficiency, we constrained exact search to certain translation lengths. Constraining search this way increases the runtime as the gamma bounds, lambda bounds. Quick, quick search. Oh, did I not tweet the tweet that I was going to tweet? Whoops. Uh, gamma. Yes. Sorry. Just, just checking what precisely that is. Uh, therefore, all results results in the section are conducted only on a subset of the test set to keep the runtime under control. Um, so they're not doing the the whole um, shared task data set. We first constrained search to translations longer than 0.25 times the source sentence length and thus excluded the empty translation from the search space. So um, whatever translation you give us, it's got to be at least a quarter as long as the input. Although this mitigates the problem slightly, figure 5, it still results in a peak in the 0305 cluster, so right where that, um, that cutoff is. This suggests that the problem of empty translations is the consequence of an inherent mile... Mm, inherent model bias towards shorter hypotheses and cannot be fixed with a length constraint. So whatever the constraint length is, your model is going to prefer things right on those boundaries because it's looking for the shortest possible constraint, uh, the shortest possible. It's not necessarily going to always return the shortest possible translation, but there's a bias towards it. Uh, so if you look at here, uh, this is when the uh, uh, ratio has been chopped to right in here. So we've gotten rid of this big uh, lump right around zero, but you can still see there's a little bit of a cluster um, right near where the, uh, the cutoff is because of this preference for shorter translations. Uh, and talking about runtime, we stopped decoding if the decoder took longer than a day for a single sentence on a single CPU, Jiminy Cricket. Um, so I mentioned usually translation is usually um, an encoder, which takes numbers, words, and turns them into numbers, and a decoder, which takes numbers and turns them into words. Um, Basically, do it in a very simplistic way. Uh, so the decoder half, uh, if it takes longer than a day to figure out a single sentence, uh, then they just they stop the decoder, which I think uh, it makes sense. Uh, exact search without length constraints is much faster and does not need minimum execution time limits. Uh, interesting. 
Interesting. So exact search is that depth first search that the, that the authors have proposed. And if you don't have a length constraint, so you don't say at least 25% uh, of the original sentence, um, it's much faster. Interesting. I guess because it's easier to not. Hmm. Is it the length comparison that's adding time? Surely not. It must change the way that the, the search is taking place in sort of a Hmm. Yeah, if any of y'all have intuitions about that, please uh, uh, mention it in the chat. Sip of water. Okay. We then constrained exact search to either the length of the best beam 10 hypothesis or the reference length. Table three shows that exact search constrained to the beam 10 hypothesis length does not improve over beam search, suggesting that any search errors between the beam search score and the global best score for that length are insufficient, insignificant enough so as not to affect the blue score. The Oracle experiment in which we constrained exact search to the correct reference length last row in table three improves the blue, improves the blue score by 0.9%, uh, points, not percent, sorry. Okay, so let's look at the tables. Uh, so using regular beam search, uh, score of 3.7, ratio of one, um, constraining results so that they are the exact uh, length of the uh, one returned by beam search does not change anything. Uh, and then constraining it so that they are the exact length of the input, or sorry, the reference translation. So the actual target um, that a human did uh, does improve uh, blue score slightly. Um, and they are suggesting that search errors between beam search score and global best score for that length are insignificant enough so as not to affect blue score. Um, so if there are some search errors in there, they're not big enough to really change the, the model output. Um, and an Oracle experiment is uh, basically you, you pretend that you can know the answer. Um, so uh, controlled leakage, I would say, in, in Kaggle terms. Uh, a popular method to counter the length bias in NMT is length normalization. Jean, Jean, et al. 2015. Mm. Boulanger? Boulan that's, a, that's not bakery, right? Boulanger? No, that has an I in it. Uh, Lewandowski, et al. 2013, which simply divides the sentence score by the sentence length. We can find the global best translation under length normalization by generalizing our exact inference scheme to length dependent lower bounds, gamma k. Okay, uh, so take whatever the score is for the sentence, divide it by the sentence length. Uh, so if it's very short, it'll be higher? That can't be right. Uh... The generalized scheme finds the best model scores for each translation length k in a certain range, e.g. 0 to 1.2 times the source sentence length. The initial lower bounds are derived from the beam 10 hypothesis, why beam is follows. What? Okay, so the... Sorry, I've stopped parsing this as language. Uh... We can find the global best translations under length normalization by generalizing our exact inference scheme to a length dependent lower bound. Okay, so during the depth first search, the exact search that they're using, um, they can be like, okay, we know this is the best candidate because we are going to sneeze. Excuse me. Uh, we know this is the best candidate given these length constraints. So you just throw out all the candidates that are shorter than that. Uh, the generalized scheme finds the best model score for each translation length k in a certain range, uh, e.g. 0 to 1.2 times the sentence length. So instead of just like cutting it off, you're like, okay, there's a little wiggle room. It's got to be in these, uh, these windows. The initial lower bounds are derived from the beam 10 hypothesis y beam as follows. Uh, so uh, gamma k is k plus 1, where I believe k is this length that you've specified. Uh, 
times this whole thing, uh, the log probability of Y beam given X uh, divided by Y beam plus one. The absolute value of Y beam plus one, so you're dividing by a positive number, a positive number greater than zero, right? Because you can have a log probability of zero. Can you? Can log probability be zero? Can log probabilities be zero? <laughs> Not defined by zero, so log probabilities can only represent non-zero probabilities. Okay. Um, I don't know why we're adding one, but I'm assuming that there's a smoothing reason for it. Exact search under length normalization does not suffer from the length deficiency anymore, last row in table four, but it is not able to match our best blue score under beam 10 search. This suggests that while length normalization biases search towards translations of roughly the correct length, it does not fix the fundamental modeling problem. Uh, so table four, uh, here is the search without length normalization. Uh, so beam, the more uh, likely you are to return the correct candidate. So here we are 100% likely to return the correct, to return a set of candidates that includes the global best translation. Um, the shorter your uh, overall uh, length of translations to inputs um, and the lower the blue score, and if you control for length normalization, you still can't get a blue score as good as the uh, score of the beam 10. Uh, so you, even with saying, hey, we're gonna ignore really short and really long uh, translations, uh, translations that are much shorter or much longer than the input, uh, you still can't get uh, a um, result as good as you can on beam 10 search. Presumably because this is still going to return inputs that are shorter than the global. It's going to return outputs that are shorter than the global maximum. And because there's a bias towards shorter outputs, uh, the model is more likely to choose those. So it's a modeling error rather than a search error. All right, so the problem, so basically what this part of the paper is saying, like, hey, it's not just because we sometimes, it's not just because our search returns something with the empty candidate, it's not something specific about the empty candidate, it is, uh, or specific about empty translations, there's this global bias in neural machine translation towards shorter translations. All right. Other researchers have also noted that large beam sizes yield shorter translations. So this seems to be something other people have ran, ran across. Ooh, Sunsov? Sunsov? I, I have no idea what language this is from. I, I can't make an educated guess. Uh, and Sarawagi? Sarawagi? 2016, argued that this model error is due to the locally normalized maximum likelihood training objective in NMT uh, that underestimates the margin between the correct translation and the shorter ones if trained with regularization and finite data. Um, so uh, these authors are suggesting that this bias towards shorter translations is due to locally normalized uh, maximum likelihood training objective. So it's like specifically due to um, the training objective in NMT, uh, and that is what's introducing the bias. A similar argument was made by, I lost my place, uh, Murray and Chiang, uh, 2018, who pointed out the difficulty for a locally normalized model to estimate the budget for all remaining longer translations. So, a locally normalized model that's working well with things near its current point. Uh, so I'm trying to think what the what this would look like. So if we are, let's say we have all of our uh, candidate translations, and we're trying to do, 
I don't know that they use stochastic gradient descent, but let's pretend that they do use stochastic gradient descent. If we are locally normalizing, it's hard to look very far away and be like, oh, actually that one that's very different from our current one is actually pretty good, and then head in that direction. Um, I think is what that sentence means. Uh, Kumar and Sarawagi, oh, same author probably, uh, demonstrated that NMT models are often poorly calibrated and then that can cause length deficiency. I don't know what calibration means in this, in this sense. So this is where you would um, go and read these papers if you were interested in learning more. Or uh, another option would be this uh, Chen et al. ACL paper, which it looks like goes into um, slightly more detail as well. Uh, Ott et al. argue that uncertainty caused by no noisy training data may play a role. Chen et al. 2018 showed that consistent best string problems for RNNs is decidable. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, consistent best strong string problems for RNNs is decidable. I'm sure that is a very precise technical term and I'm just not picking up what they're putting down. Uh, we provide an alternative DFS algorithm, depth first search, uh, that relies on the monotonic nature of model scores rather than consistency and, and that often converges in practice. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first work that reports the exact number of search errors in NMT as prior work often relied on approximation, e.g. via nbest lists, ni, nihu, nihau, nehus, at all 2017, or constraints, Star Stahlberg at all 2018b. Um, so the uh, big, one of the big contributions of this paper is this depth first search algorithm uh, that says, hey, we know how many search errors there are, uh, which means that you can um, decouple the search and the modeling errors. Why is there this bias in modeling errors? Um, that's what all of these people are talking about. Conclusion, we have presented an exact inference scheme for NMT. Exact search may not be practical. Please don't, please don't implement this for your, your NMD project uh, unless you're doing uh, research and need to know the number of modeling errors. Nope, number of search errors, which would also tell you the number of modeling errors. If you are defining modeling errors as errors where you return the, um, the empty string. But it allowed us to discover deficiencies in widely used NMT models. We link deteriorating blue scores of large beams with the reduction of search errors and show that the model often prefers the empty translations, uh, an evidence of NMTU's failure to properly model adequacy. Um, so an adequate, I was like, there's like, what is it, like adequacy and correctness? I don't know. There's, there's um, a, a number of different um, ways of evaluating translations. Um, but... Uh, they're suggesting that these class of modeling errors are due specifically to the class of models that are being used, uh, and specifically the, the neural machine translation models. Uh, our investigations into length constrained exact search, our investigations into length constrained exact search suggested that simple heuristics like length normalization are unlikely to remedy the problem satisfactorily. So there is, um, a overall bias in neural machine translation models towards shorter outputs. Uh, and that is hard to correct for. Um, and it doesn't seem that there is consensus on what is causing this, uh, this bias in, in models. And um, I would say the, the vast majority, if not all of the neural, of the neural machine, of the machine translation literature uh, that I have run across in the last little bit has all the neural models, which means that uh, neural meaning deep learning. So that includes things like doo -doo -doo, uh, RNNs and all flavors of RNNs, uh, CNNs and transformer based models. So all of these models have a bias towards shorter outputs, uh, which is worrying and suggests that there's a um, uh, big problem <laughs> that's affecting pretty much all of the machine translation research and work and implementations that people are uh, using today. Uh, and one of the reasons that we haven't noticed it previously is because uh, 
the search errors have sort of shielded it because they're not returning as many short models, I guess. So they're not returning as many short candidates, um, which means that uh, it's less likely that you're going to get a very inadequate candidate translation. Uh, and so using, so the fact that there are search errors, it was, is what's preventing more modeling errors because you can't pick a very bad choice if it's not available, if that makes sense, uh, is what I'm understanding. Uh, and just to uh, uh, reiterate, so again, this is uh, an email the author sent me. So um, if you're watching, thank you. This was very helpful. Uh, less rigorously, these results suggest that NMT, neural machine translation systems, may be deficient, i.e. that they assign significant probabilities to derivations that do not yield translations. In this way, they might not define a probability distribution over translations in the same straightforward way that e.g. an n-gram language model would do. Uh, and I wonder if, so there was this sort of disciplinary shift, there were a couple. Um, the big ones were from completely rule-based systems to more statistical-based systems to more um, neural-based systems. And uh, statistical systems tend to be pretty intuitive, especially if you have a stats background in a way that neural systems kind of aren't. Like it's hard to, um, I don't know, if you've heard about problems with interpretability and how, you know, neural systems are black boxes and all of that, um, they're just hard to understand the decision region of. Um, so it feels almost like this is a, because the outputs were comparable, or because we, we as a field, again, I don't work in machine translation, um, were comparing neural results to um, statistical results, there may have been sort of like an inherent bias on this parts of researchers to assume that they were comparable in other ways as well. Uh, and that this is a really pretty, pretty big problem. Uh, and they they don't suggest an, an answer. Uh, in fact, they suggest that one answer uh, that you think might work, so constraining length, still leads to a bias. So uh, when you know you have returned the correct result, I'm looking for this guy. So when you know you've returned the correct result, these green ones over here, uh, if you constrain the length, you still see a little cluster of results right around the length you constrained. Um, and you don't want to constrain the length to like be one or more, uh, because if you look at the reference translations here, so these purple ones, uh, you can see that they're more or less normally distributed. Um, so no matter where you sort of put the cutoff, you're going to find a lot of translations, uh, a lot of can returned translations sort of clustering around there, not necessarily because they're better translations, but because they're shorter and there's a bias towards shorter things. So um, that's worrying. <laughs> that's, this is, uh, yeah, this is kind of a worrying paper. Oh, uh, acknowledgments. This work was supported by the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, uh, grant, blah, 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 and is performed using resources provided by the Cambridge Tier 2 system operated by the University of Cambridge Research Computing System, also funded, founded, funded by an EPSRC grant. Um, oh, this is a, a link to the, the computing services. Uh, yeah, so this is, hmm, this is kind of a wor worrying paper. Um, like I said, the, the vast majority of machine translation papers um, I'm trying to think of the last non-neural machine translation paper I saw. It's been a while. It's been quite a while. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Andy says, is there a cat involved in all of this? Um, I'm trying to think of a good uh, uh, way of saying we, we're the cat, <laughs> like we're the uh, curiosity got us, um, us being people who are, who are working in NLP. Um, yeah. So I don't have a, a good sort of, for this. I think it's a, 
a interesting and important paper. Um, and if you are working with, um, so this is specifically for neural machine translation, but any sort of neural sequence to sequence uh, work is presumably going to have, where you, you have to generate and then decide between possible sequences is probably gonna have the same bias. Um, and just saying, hey, I don't want very short things is not going to fix it. You're still going to get that bias. Uh, and even with, um, and even with uh, the same model, um, uh, not making search errors seems to create more opportunities for modeling errors. So I guess my, um, like a practical recommendation is if you're working on machine translation or um, neural machine translation or any sort of neural sequence to sequence model, um, use a smaller beam, except that you will have search errors um, in order, except that you will have more search errors in order to have fewer modeling errors, I think is the sort of uh, practical takeaway for, for practitioners. Um, and also maybe consider non-neural methods. Although I, again, I don't think there's been, I'm sure people, let me put it this way, I'm sure people are working on non-neural methods. I just haven't run across them recently. Um, particularly as I've been reading more in the, uh, in the uh, transformer literature, which is uh, very neural <laughs> by definition. It's all deep learning. Yeah, all right. Well, on that sort of, um, it's not necessarily sad, but cautionary note, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Uh, I will be back on Friday for live coding, and uh, we will not be back next Wednesday or the Wednesday after uh, because those are both holidays in the United States, um, and I will not be here. Uh, but we will be back on next Friday, this Friday, the 20th, uh, and probably also next Friday, the 27th, uh, for our regularly scheduled 9 a.m. Pacific live streams. Uh, and I hope I will see you there. And if not, uh, I will see you on Kaggle. Thank you for joining me today, everybody. Uh, I hope this was informative, <laughs> if not uh, especially comforting. Uh, and I will talk to you later. Bye.